Hi, welcome back to my studio. This is the final setting, the third setting on uh, the painting over an old painting session we've been doing. I want to talk about changes from the photograph that we've made original now and what we're going to do from this point on. So this is the photograph that was the impetus for the painting. And as I talked about earlier in the first two settings, the horizon line, I moved it down a little bit. And because I'm not a great photographer, I know my darks and my lights are, are too contrasty. The darks are too dark, the, the lights, the whites are way too bright. So I compensated for that in the painting. I also made a little compositional change here in the foreground where it reads in a little more of an angle for more of a read in. But other than that, you know, it's pretty close to the photograph. I also, did, I'm probably not gonna put the waterfall back here behind because it's, it, it's a little bit busy. It, it, it takes away from the emphasis of this aspect of the waterfall. So, you know, those, those are things, you need to look at paintings as much or more than you paint on them at this stage. You know, um, it's really important that you think about the brush strokes, that they're just not mindless brush strokes. You're not just standing at the easel and painting. So the photograph's gonna go away now, and I'm gonna look at the painting and make choices on the painting that are gonna make it a better painting. I'm not making the photograph. So the photograph goes up. So the changes, I've been looking at this thing for a couple of days, and the changes I've decided to make are, I'm gonna give it some more sky. There's a little bit of sky right here, but I'm gonna also punch some sky in areas around here to give it a little more air. You know, I, as a photographer, I can't take out that density of the forest here, but as a painter, I can lighten it up a little bit and give it a little more air and make the painting a little, a little more breathable. You know, we've got a big barrier here, and then we've got another barrier here. So if I open that up a little bit visually and mentally, it's going to lighten the painting up a little bit. So that's, that's an important aspect of what I want to do. Also, the finished part, this is where I usually mess up paintings. You know, I got to tell you, this painting is, this has been a pretty good painting for me. Um, if you watch the first two videos, you know, the block in over the painting, and this is a 30 inch by 40 inch, the block in was like 20 minutes, and it was a, you know, pretty solid block in. Uh, the second setting, which was our last setting, I think I worked about 30, 35 minutes on it. These were both in real time, and, you know, it got to a point where, okay, this is finished here. So, the block in for me in the middle part, those two parts really are a lot more engaging, you know, more, I'm really painting. This part where I pull the painting together, you, you really have to be in your zone. You have to be concentrated because it's so easy to overwork a painting. I hear so many artists say, well, you know, I just should have stopped. And it's true, we, we have a tendency to overwork the stuff more than we have a tendency to underpaint a painting. So I kind of have to watch that, you know, it, and also you'll notice I've gone from the first video, I'm painting very big and gestural using this brush and the middle paint, the middle part, the second part of the painting, I moved down to the filbert, which is I think an eight and did a lot. Of, this is good for, for different edges, you know, soft edges, hard edges. This, this is a good brush for that. And so I moved that and that, and then I went to, the angular sash for some of the hard edges and stuff. And so probably this last, the last setting today, I'll be using these two brushes. I won't use this big gestural brush because I'm tightening down. Now, the, the, the deal is, you guys, the standing up and moving back from your painting. You know, for years I've wrestled with this, the viewing distance versus the painting distance. You know, we can only move, paint so far back because our arm's only this long. And so, when you're painting, you're much closer to the painting and you see the brushwork much more intimately. And so when you go back to the viewing distance, which just depending on the size of the painting, this one's probably about eight, 10, 12 feet. Um, you go back to the viewing distance, everything comes together, the brushwork you know, merges and you see the objects represented. Um, I always you had a problem reconciling the abstract with the representational. because, And I always wound up making the paintings too tight 
because I kept wanting to take it more and more representational. Well, what happens for me when I do that is they lose their spontaneity. They, they lose their lightness. Their, I love the brushwork. So now after 50 years of painting, I'm really into the fact that the thing vacillates back and forth. Then when I walk back, it comes together. When I walk up on it, I see the brushwork. And so I kind of want to hold the brushwork and at the same time represent something. And so for me, this gestural versus representational getting tighter is kind of a delicate act. You know, how much more work do I want to put in on the painting? And while I'm talking about that, time on a painting, pricing paintings, you guys, if you're selling your artwork, you know, that, boy, I, that was something I wrestled with for years. I used to price work way, way, way back by how well I liked it. That doesn't work because how well I like a painting, somebody else may not respond to it at all and may like one that I'm not crazy about. You know, it's kind of like musicians. They have their favorite songs that they've written. Well, artists have their favorite paintings, but you can't price that way because it's a personal thing. Uh, you know, you want to make sure your paintings are professional and good before you put them out. But pricing, basically you want to price by size. That, that's really the, the best way to price. You can't price by time. Here's a 30 by 40, and if I price that by time and I've got two hours work in on it, you, you, that doesn't work either. So pricing by size, setting your prices, you know, establish your price by size and, and stick with that. Um, there's a great story about Matisse. When he was in his 60s, he was in a show, and he had done this gorgeous self-portrait that was very uh, limited in, in drawing. It had maybe a dozen lines, but it described him beautifully. It looked like him. And it was just very sparse in his use of line and, and elegant. And somebody at the show saw, you know, and they're like, and how long did it take you to do that? You know, he looked at him and he said, oh, about 60 years. So, you know, the fact that I've only got maybe a couple hours work in this physical work, that, that doesn't matter. It's my 50 years that I've spent to getting to this point. And the four paint, the three paintings that are underneath this painting. Think about that. I mean, there's three paintings under here, all that time spent. So to get to this. So you can't price by time. You know, serendipity happens and you get a good piece. I've done paintings in an hour that were, that were spectacular. I've also labored on paintings for weeks that were, that were okay. So, you know, what is, you know, how do you, you price by size? Um, what's finished? When a painting's finished for me is when I don't want to work on it anymore. Basically, that's it. I have 80 paintings in my painting closet, and I'm constantly pulling them out and looking at them. And if over time they don't want to get painted on, then they're finished. Or they get painted over like this one, or they get worked on again. But you know, finishing a painting, you know, I don't, it's, it's, I guess they're finished when I sell them and they're gone, but think about your work, make your work, make conscious efforts, look at the work as much as you paint on it. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to finish this painting. And I think in another half an hour, I can pull it together and do some of the things I want to do. Also, I want to point out in the photograph, um, if you notice the painting was not or the photograph was kind of monochromatic. I mean, there, you have a sense of light, but it's not real strong. It was an overcast day. Again, a photographer, I can't control that. I deal with it, but I can't control it. As a painter, I'm going to change that. I'm going to give this a stronger sense of light up from this area here, reading across like it is in the photograph, but I'm going to make it a little stronger. I'm going to make it a little more emphasized. And I think that'll make the painting pop more. Light, you guys, in paintings, whether they're even non-rep paintings, the sense of light is powerful. You know, Caravaggio, Rembrandt, all these artists knew how powerful the sense of light in their paintings were. And, you know, light is what charges a painting. So I'm going to use that element and make this painting pop more than the photograph. So hang in there and let's see what happens in the next 30 minutes.
So I'm gonna call this the third setting. It's really not the final setting. I'm probably gonna work on it a little more, but it's really nitpicky stuff at this point. The painting is pretty much pulled together where I want it to be. Um, it's just a matter now of looking at it. Um, I spend more time sitting and looking at this point than I actually do making brush work. So it'd be pretty boring to continue the video. But what I will do is I will, when I'm done, um, in a couple of days, I will post this image, this painting, finished painting on my Facebook page, Michael Galt Studio Facebook. Um, so you can check it out. Hopefully this gave you some insights into painting over an old painting. And you know, it's just a continuation. Focus on the process, everyone. Don't focus on the product. Let the product happen. So take care and God bless.